Hi my lovelies, welcome back to my channel. My name is Sally and what I do on my channel is I talk about true crime cases from all over the world. I also will be doing some conspiracy theories and some urban legends at some point, but I tend to like the true crimes just a little bit more, well not like, I'm interested in them. So if you're new here, welcome. I hope you enjoy. Please remember to subscribe to my channel and like and comment. That would mean the world to me. Also, if you see any of my videos over on any of my other social media like Facebook or Instagram, please give them a little bit of a like, a comment and a share. That would also be absolutely fantastic for me and I would really appreciate that. That's all the good stuff that I need to get out of the way. So last week, and last week we spoke about Adriana Huto and that was a very, very awful case. I don't really think there's any resolution in my mind about that case. There was a legal resolution, but that's pretty much where we left it. There was nothing else we could say about that. This week, however, we are going to jump over to the UK and talk about one of the most prolific serial killers in UK or British history. And if you don't know who I'm talking about, I am talking about Peter Sutcliffe. Have you heard of him? If you haven't, one, why? Have you been living under a bridge? And two, you're about to find out about him and he is a twisted individual, let me tell you. So Peter Sutcliffe. Peter Sutcliffe, AKA the Yorkshire Ripper, which is what you actually might know him by, is a British born serial killer who killed 13 women and attempted to kill seven more. It came up on the news a few weeks ago that the coronavirus had killed him, which is fantastic, I think. So I thought I would do a little bit of a story time case for you today. I am gonna give you a little bit of background information on Peter Sutcliffe, just because I like to research this thing and I like to have all the details. Some people might think that's weird and that's fine, but I like it, so I'm just gonna share that with you. So, Peter Sutcliffe, he was born on the 2nd of June, 1946, in Bradford, which is in the United Kingdom, and it's kind of up north, like near Manchester and stuff. His parents were John and Kathleen Sutcliffe, and his father was a mill worker, which was a very common job in those days, and his mother was, from what I can gather, a stay-at-home mother, so she raised Peter, and just, like, did the general housework kind of thing. Peter himself was a very awkward child. He was a loner, he didn't have many friends, he spent a lot of time visiting the wax museum in his area, and he was particularly interested in the wax statues of like disease and people that had committed crimes and things like that. That's just the type of kid that he was. Also, he wasn't a very smart kid, he wasn't very bright, and he had very, very poor grades. Based on that, he decided that he was going to leave school at 15 and go straight into work. So that's essentially what he did. Now, the first job that he got, he must have been a teenager. He wasn't even 18 by this point. And the first job on record for him was that of a grave digger. That's kind of morbid, very morbid. And it actually plays a lot in this case. The grave digger thing is actually used as in his defence. I'm like, like, I'll explain more about that later. But it just seems like a very odd job to have as a child. So he continued with this job for a few years and then in 1967 he met a young lady called Sonia. And I'm not going to pronounce her surname because I, I can't pronounce her surname. So we're just going to call her Sonia. Yeah. So he met Sonia and the couple actually decided to marry very quickly. Unfortunately, the couple suffered many miscarriages through the first few years of their marriage and ultimately they were told in the end that they couldn't bear children and this really upset them, they really struggled with this. However, Sonia decided that she would get a career, so she went back to trying to get her career in teaching, which she had was originally doing before she met Peter. She did extremely well with this. She qualified quite quickly and got her first teaching job. Using the wages from her job, the couple managed to buy their first home at Six Garden Lane in Heaton. And this is the address that will come up prominently in the case because this is where Peter lived at the time of his arrest. By 1975, Sutcliffe had had a string of jobs. He'd obviously left the job as a gravedigger and he went on to do some menial labor jobs. 
during one of these jobs that he had, he decided he was going to use some of the money that his wife was earning mainly to get his HGV license, which he did manage to get very quickly. Unfortunately, the company he was working for when he got his license let him go. I would I say unfortunately, but you know, he was stealing. Yeah, he was stealing from the company. He was stealing tires and little knickknack things. So the company let him go. He did, however, quickly get another job at another HGV place and that was his job at the time when he was committing these crimes. By this time, it was 1976 and Sutcliffe was known to some of the local prostitutes. He frequently visited them and he also, from a very young age, it is rumoured that he used to watch them. He used to stalk prostitutes or sex workers, as I'm going to call them today. And he was just very obsessed with what they do and very obsessed with the people that visited them. He tried to work out why they would do that kind of thing, like why they would visit prostitutes. So now we're gonna go back a few years and this is a couple of years after he met his wife and he married her. So 1969, Sutcliffe attacked his first known victim. She was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. A few years earlier, Sutcliffe had visited a prostitute himself and during the work she had conned him out of a lot of money and she'd stolen his wallet and stolen some of his possessions so on this evening in 1969 he was actually out looking for her because she is the one that had done him over unfortunately he couldn't find her and he just got angrier and angrier and angrier so he decided that he would go out with his friend to continue looking for her Again, he couldn't find her and he came across another sex worker. This sex worker is unnamed. We don't know who this is and we don't need to know who this is, to be fair. And he, like I say, he came across her and he took her down an alleyway. The woman survived and she told detectives that he beat her about the head with a stone inside a sock. After the incident, Sutcliffe ran back to his friend's van and told him to drive away quickly. Now, this is the first opportunity missed by the police because... The woman, because she survived, she was managed to identify Peter Sutcliffe and also the van, the number plate from the van. So, so that's how they managed to find out who he was and where he lived. The police did uh, make a visit to his home and he said that she deserved it and he didn't deny it. And the police said that he was a very lucky boy because she wasn't going to press charges. So the case was essentially dropped and Sutcliffe was free to carry on with his crimes. Now the rest of what I'm going to say to you is kind of like a little bit of a timeline. So I'm going to really break the crimes down and just give you like dates and things like that. So just bear with me. I'm going to do the best I can. In July of 1975, he attacked another woman. Again, her name is not mentioned. He hit her over the head with a hammer and he sliced at her stomach. Fortunately for the woman, he was interrupted and he fled the scene. August of 1975, again, he attacked this woman with a hammer. Again, she is unnamed. And again, he was interrupted, so he left her alive also. Later on that August, he actually attacked a 14-year-old girl. And again, her name is a mentioned for legal reasons. He hit her over the head and slashed her to her stomach. But this time, she was he was interrupted because a car came down the street, so the headlights interrupted him. So again, he left her alive. Now, in October of 1974, this is when he commits his first murder. Wilma McCann was a mother of four who was working as a sex worker to make ends meet, basically. She was working in Leeds when Sutcliffe approached her on the street. He took her to a secluded spot and then he struck her over the head five times with a hammer. He then stabbed her 15 times in the neck, stomach and chest before he dumped her body. A massive police search for the man that did this crime was then eventually launched. Peter Sutcliffe wasn't connected to this straight away. In January of 1976, a 42-year-old sex worker called Emily Jackson was working. Sutcliffe picked her up, took her to an area where there was a lot of derelict buildings. He then hit her over the head with a hammer and stabbed her with a st sharpened screwdriver. He also stomped on her thigh, which left a boot imprint on the victim. He then dumped her body and she was found a few days later. The two murders weren't initially connected. They didn't know they had a serial killer on their hands at the time. Obviously, eventually that would come to light, but currently at this moment, they were treat as two separate crimes. In May of 1976, Marcella Claxton, who was 20 years old, was walking home from a party when Peter Sutcliffe offered to give her a lift home. She accepted, which was very common in those days, but during the journey, she said that she needed to use the bathroom. 
So he pulled over and she got out. And as she was getting out of the van, Sutcliffe hit her about the head with a hammer. It's unclear why, but he ended up leaving this young woman alive. And fortunately, she did survive and she actually testified against him later on in court. Now we jump forward to February of 1977. Another sex worker called Irene Richardson was working in Chapel Town when she was approached by Sutcliffe. He picked her up off offering sex. He hit her over the head with a hammer until she was dead. He also mutilated her body with a knife and he left his tyre tracks from his car also at the scene. But again, this wouldn't be linked together. None of these crimes were being linked together straight away. In April of 1997, he attacked and killed another sex worker called Patricia Atkinson. Sorry, my pronunciation is awful. She was known as Tina, so we'll call her Tina. He again picked her up on the street, but this time she took him back to her flat. And when her body was later found, the police found a boot print on the bed sheets. Now, later on, a lot later on, his boot print would be linked to Peter Sutcliffe. And that's how they caught him for the crime on Tina. But at this moment, all they could do was take in the evidence and hope something came forward, I guess. They were having no luck at finding out who this person was. In June of that year, he attacked 16-year-old Jane MacDonald. She wasn't a sex worker and he hit her over the head and cut her stomach area and left her for dead. Now, this is the moment when the media and the general public panic because in those days, sex workers weren't treated with very much respect. A lot like they are now, to be fair. Nobody treats sex workers with respect, which is disgusting. They're just doing their job. They've got to make, that, they've got to make ends meet, you know? And um, because this was essentially a child and she was an, what they called an innocent child, there was a lot of uproar from the public. And this is when people started to think that this person who was going around killing all these women will literally kill anyone. Then in July, Sutcliffe attacked another woman. Her name was Maureen Long and she was from Bradford. This time he left the woman alive. I don't think he left her alive intentionally. I think he intended to kill her but she did survive. By October, he had attacked a woman called Jean Jordan. She again was a sex worker and she was from Manchester. In this case, he took his victim to the cemetery and he paid her one of the new five pound notes that had not long been released. After he would bludgeoned her to death and he'd stabbed her, he dumped her body in the cemetery and went home. Now him and his wife that night were hosting a party during this party, he all of a sudden, for some reason, thought that the five pound note would actually be able, be able to implicate him in this crime. So panicking, he left the party telling people he was going to get more drink and some cigarettes and he went back to the cemetery. He searched the body, but he couldn't find the five pound note. He obviously got very angry, so he mutilated her body and moved her. Now, when her body was found a couple of days later, the police did manage to find that five pound note, which she had hidden in a secret compartment in her handbag. This five pound note could be linked to the bank that had given it out. All of, all of the notes have serial numbers on them and they can be traced back to where they've come from. Unfortunately, in this case, the bank couldn't pinpoint exactly who had this five pound note because thousands, well, hundreds or thousands of people had been paid on that Friday. So they did give the police a list of all the names that could potentially have had this five pound note. And this became a massive task for police to identify where this five pound note actually came from. Sutcliffe was actually interviewed as part of this five pound note inquiry. However, he had what would be considered a solid alibi by him. He claimed that he was at a party with his wife and nobody at this party ever mentioned that Sutcliffe had left to go and buy alcohol and cigarettes. So uh, in terms of the police, they thought that it couldn't be him because he had a solid alibi. In December, he attacked a young lady called Marilyn Moore. She again was a sex worker, but she survived. She was able to give police a very good description of her attacker. And later on, when the police find out that it's Peter Sutcliffe that has committed these crimes, the photo fit that she managed to create was identical to him. So it makes you question. The police knew who Peter Sutcliffe was. He'd been interviewed a couple of times on different attacks and for different reasons. So how had they not looked at that and thought of Peter Sutcliffe? I won't know, but they didn't. 
In January of 1978, the police had dropped the case for the £5 note because they were having no success because obviously they've interviewed the person and let him go. But anyway, they, they closed that case and decided to move on to find other evidence and work different parts of the case instead. During this time, Sutcliffe attacked another young lady. Yvonne Pearson was 21 years old and she was from Bradford. He beat her over the head with a hammer and then jumped on her chest until she died. Oh, what an awful way to go. This is a bit weird, but he also shoved horse hair into her mouth and left her body under an abandoned sofa weird it just seems like like his um crimes and his murders were progressing quite rapidly and they were getting more and more weird and more and more violent in late january a young lady called helen reichter reichter i think her name is i'm really sorry she was 18 she was also a sex worker and she was attacked as soon as she got into sutcliffe's car he made her strip naked and then he stabbed her 15 times he also hit her over the head with a hammer five times and dumped her body in may a young lady called vera mealfield was walking through the royal infirmary hospital car park when sutcliffe hit her over the head with a hammer he killed her after hitting her five times and just left her body where it dropped and then there's quite a big gap nearly a year and then we jump forward to april of 1979 and a young lady who worked at the local building society her name was josephine whittaker she was 19 was like i said was walking home from work and he attacked her and hit her over the head with a hammer evidence was actually found at the scene but unfortunately the police being the stupid idiots that they are were distracted by a hoax phone call and a hoax letter that they received in april police received a tape recording of a man that was claiming to be the yorkshire ripper he described in great detail a victim that he had killed and what he had done to her and he said quote i'm jack i see you're having no luck catching me i have the greatest respect for you george but lord you're no nearer catching me than you were four years ago when i started my crimes end quote based on this recording police started searching for a man with a weird side accent which is nothing like what peter sutcliffe sounded like so they started looking in the area of sunderland and tyne the media dubbed this man the weird side jack weird side jack sent two more letters to the police claiming to be responsible for the crime that i spoke about earlier and this seemed very legit to the police because the crime he was talking about which took place in preston they were under the assumption that the media didn't know anything about this crime however they were wrong and the details of all this crime that Wearside jack had said in his letters and in his videotape were actually public knowledge so he'd taken this information out of newspapers and off the news reports and he'd gone with it also i do want to point out that peter sutcliffe actually wasn't responsible for the crime in preston that was later linked to a different person who wasn't a serial killer but he killed his ex-girlfriend or something so this wasn't actually linked to Peter at all. The police based a lot of their own investigation on this Wearside Jack and this distracted them from what was really happening underneath their nose. They spent a few years looking for him and then eventually they, they closed it because they couldn't really work out who it was and they started to get a little bit suspicious that this wasn't the real Yorkshire Ripper. So if we jump forward to 2005, obviously the police had caught Sutcliffe by this point. They reopened the hoax case. The DNA on the envelopes was now able to be tested, but back in the 70s, they didn't have the forensic science that we have now. So they could actually now test the DNA, which is what they did. And, they bought, and this brought back a DNA match to a man called John Samuel Humble. He was a unemployed alcoholic whose DNA was already on the system because he had been done for a variety of minor offences such as drink driving and drunken disorderly. So they arrested him immediately and he was charged with trying to pervert the course of justice. He got eight years in prison but he later died in prison. Now we'll jump back over to Peter Sutcliffe and in September of 1979 he attacked 20 year old Barbara Leach. She was a Bradford University student and he hit her over the head until she was dead and he dumped her body less than a mile from her accommodation at the time. Now in 1980, in April to be exact, Sutcliffe was actually arrested for drink driving. During this time he was um, arrested but he was released awaiting his trial. They're the words I was looking for. Come on Sally, get your act together. During this time he actually killed two more women. Another failing from the police. If they'd just kept him in bloody prison... In August, he killed Margarita Wells, I think that's what her name is, or Margaret, probably got a 
and the R. I can't do it. She was a 47 year old woman and Jacqueline Hills, who was 20 and she was again another university student, but she was a university student for Leeds this time. He also attacked another three women during this time. They fortunately survived, but come on, come on, Manchester police. What are you doing? Bloody idiots. Why, has anybody else noticed that during a lot of these videos, the police fuck up a lot. A lot. Like, if they arrest and charge people in the fucking first place, they wouldn't go on and kill more people. Or if they arrested and charged people for sexual crimes before they became serial killers, they wouldn't go on and kill people. There's got to be a lesson learned from this somewhere, surely. Anyway, in November of 1980, one of Peter Sutcliffe's associates, oh, sorry, a bit of tongue twister, went to police and told them that he thought Peter Sutcliffe was responsible for these crimes and he gave him a lot of reasons why but again the police are absolutely fucking useless and they lost this information in the mountain of paperwork that they had against this man it's just a joke really then on the 2nd of January 1981 Peter Sutcliffe was pulled over by the police because he had false number plates on his car when they pulled him over, they noticed that, the, that he had a young lady who turned out to be a 24-year-old sex worker in his car with him. She was obviously his next victim. Because of the false number plates, the police decided to arrest Sutcliffe on the spot and they took him to Dewsbury Police Station. Now, this is where it gets a little bit weirder. So Sutcliffe was obviously arrested and he was booked and after he was booked, he was obviously strip searched. So he took off his clothes and on the bottom half of his body, he had a V-neck jumper, which was upside down. So his legs were through the armholes and his genitalia was exposed by the V-neck. He also was wearing knee pads. Very weird. Initially, when they questioned him, he denied all knowledge of any of these crimes. He didn't know what they were talking about. The police obviously went and searched the area where the car had been pulled over which is lucky they did because in the bushes they found a knife and a hammer and some rope basically a murder kit that they suspect Sutcliffe had dumped when he said that he needed to go to the bathroom which they let him do also at the police station they searched the bathroom because he again said he needed to go for a wee so they decided right we're going to go and have a look just in case he's dumped everything and again he had dumped another knife in the bathroom they didn't find much evident at evidence at his house they obviously brought in his car which they already had and boots and some items of clothing to see if they can get any dna off them his wife was in complete shock she honestly had no idea anyway after a few days of questioning on the 4th of january sutcliffe decided enough was enough and he admitted to everything and he went into all the crimes in very, very, very great detail. However, he claimed that when he was a grave digger, remember I said earlier he was a grave digger? He was standing at the grave of a Polish man and he heard the voice of God. And God told him that he must rid the world of evil and he must rid the world of all the harlots that are selling their bodies for sex. During his interviews with the police, Peter said something that everybody pulls up on because it's kind of strange. He said, quote, I was cleaning up the place a bit, end quote. Very nice of you. I mean, maybe you should clean up your attitude. No. The only time Sutcliffe ever expressed any kind of remorse is when he spoke, when they spoke about his youngest murdered victim, which was Jane MacDonald, the 16 year old. He was very upset about that. He did also briefly touch on the point that he attacked a young girl that he thought was a sex worker and turned out to be a 14-year-old schoolgirl. He got very upset about that as well. He said he never wanted to hurt children. That wasn't his intention and that wasn't what God told him to do. And he made a mistake and he was sorry about those two crimes. Screw the sex workers though, eh? Don't care about them, despite the fact they're humans. So on the 5th of January, Sutcliffe was officially charged with 13 counts of murder and seven counts of attempted murder. He denied the murder charges based on diminished responsibility, but he did accept the seven attempted murders. The prosecution and the defense managed to come up with a plea deal in terms of especially the attempted murders. The prosecution were actually going to accept this. 
However, the judge wasn't convinced by this, so he ordered them to come to his court and give them verbal arguments as to why that this should be accepted. After they had done this, he decided that it should be up to a jury of his peers to decide whether he is innocent or guilty, and he wasn't going to accept that plea. He did not believe, despite the fact that during the time he was awaiting trial, Sutcliffe had seen four psychologists who all said that he suffered with paranoid schizophrenia, Despite that, the judge said he doesn't think he's mad, he just thinks he's evil. So he denied the plea deal and set a trial date. On the 5th of May 1981, the jury trial began. It's all the stuff that I've already spoke about. The prosecution were obviously saying how he was mentally imbalanced and were proving that he'd killed these women. They were managed to link a lot of evidence, a lot of DNA was being tested the footprint, the tyre track, all that kind of thing was eventually linked to him. And the only defence that they could come up with on the defence table was that he was criminally insane. He heard a voice of God, he heard voices, and he had four diagnoses of paranoid schizophrenia. So he was obviously crazy at the time of these crimes. The trial lasted two weeks and the jury took only a few hours to come back and convict Peter Sutcliffe of the... 13 murders and 7 attempted murders. He was found guilty and he was sentenced to 20 concurrent life sentences. So that means the 20 life, sentence, life sentences will be back to back. So this man would never have been released from prison. The judge did say that Peter Sutcliffe would have to serve 30 years before there was any chance of parole. Because sometimes if you get a conviction of say 20 concurrent life sentences... It has without parole at the end or with parole and he was granted the one with parole initially so after 30 years he could apply for parole based on good behavior based on being a changed person based on being medicated anything like that however in july of 2010 just before he could apply for parole the high court issued Sutcliffe with something called a whole life tariff now in the uk there are not many i'll see if i can find the number and i'll put it in my description not many people who have been given whole life tariffs and these um tend to be given to people that are very 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 dangerous individuals for example the moors murderers uh, fred and rose west people like that who are very dangerous people and shouldn't ever be allowed on the street ever again are given whole life sentences and like i've said this means they will never be released until the day they die there is no parole there is no hearings there is no nothing there is no appeals there is nothing you can do that's it whole life sentence whole life tariff done you'll be in prison for the rest of your life and then in november of 2020 peter sutcliffe died from coronavirus he denied any treatment he denied any help and he died at the hospital and lots of people rejoiced let me tell you lots of people rejoiced he was a sick 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 man <sighs> so that's the basic story but i just want to quickly touch on afterwards so the police investigation was obviously brought under massive scrutiny they failed many of those victims and there's no way that you can deny that they interviewed Sutcliffe approximately nine times during the investigation and each time they basically took on his word they didn't do much in much investigation into Sutcliffe himself. They just, he would say he was th at this place when this murder was happening. He had this alibi and they'd be like, oh, okay, mate, you can go. They didn't do it properly. And then they spent so much time on the hoax. It begs into question. Obviously, they didn't know it was a hoax and I get that. But there should have been a way... I mean, regardless, actually, even if someone sends you in a videotape, you still have to investigate other things. But they just stopped any other investigation completely. Also, I want to quickly touch on the fact that feminists were fuming because of the way that the police and the press handled the fact that they were sex workers. It made them feel like they were not validating the fact that they were people and they were humans. And then people that weren't sex workers were called the proper victims. I mean, what the fuck is that about? I mean, seriously. In this day and age, you wouldn't have that kind of shit. But back in the 70s and 80s, they saw sex workers as scum and basically said that they bought it on themselves, which is absolutely fucking vile. Disgusting. 
So obviously that again was another thing that was investigated and rightly so. The Home Office investigated the whole case as a general because also there was the issue of the paperwork always being lost and this was because they didn't have a proper filing system. They would just dump paperwork in a room that they had and it would pile on and pile on and pile on. So they couldn't ever find any information they needed which is probably how Sutcliffe slipped through some of the cracks sometimes and this was unacceptable so the home office did investigate the investigation brought up massive issues with the police force and the lead detective himself he recommended many points that needed to be worked on for future cases a lot of them have been taken on in all fairness like the filing system that kind of thing and the, the way that they talk about victims they needed to change that that was absolutely disgusting and in most part, in 90% of police officers, that has happened. So the report did a fantastic job at criticising what was an absolute crap investigation and bringing in policies to change that. And a lot of these policies have now been followed. So that's great. So that's the case of Peter Sutcliffe. I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope you followed what I was saying I hope you understand what I was saying. I tried my best. It's Serial killers are always really complicated. And when there's 13 murder victims and seven attempted murders, it can be quite confusing. But feel free to rewind, pause, whatever you need to do. I just hope I did a fantastic job. Hope you enjoyed my video. Anyway. I'm going to love you and leave you. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Thank you so much for being here. I really uh, appreciate it. Don't forget to subscribe, like, comment and share my videos on Facebook. That would be fantastic. And remember, be safe out there. Don't kill anybody or become a serial killer. And have a lovely day. Okay, love you. Bye.